Can you close the door so that people don't go in and out? Make sure that the doors are closed. Yes. Excellencies, the ministers, Dr. Peter Hulgum, DG of C4, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. It is the most delightful moment for me for having this most wonderful opportunity to be here in Jakarta, the beautiful capital city of Republic of Indonesia. Indeed, I'm very much proud of myself to be able to join all of you at this very special occasion of Forest Asia Summit 2014. Together, we successfully held for the first time in ASEAN continent. For having this wonderful opportunity to visit a great country of Indonesia and the people, let me express my sincere gratitude to the government of Indonesia, particularly to His Excellency, Mr. Susili Banban, you who you know, President of the Republic of Indonesia, for his kind permission and guidance to convey the summit and His Excellency, Mr. Zulkifli Hassan, Minister of Minister for Ministry of Forestry, for kindly ex extending invitation to me to attend this very important summit and given me an opportunity to talk. I would also like to thank Dr. Peter Hogan, Director General of C4 and his staffs for all the excellent arrangement provided to my delegation. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, before I begin my plenary speech, I would like to extend my warmest greeting to you all. I would also like to express my sincere wish to you all to be in physical and spiritual well-being on this very remarkable day. On behalf of the government of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar, and on my own behalf, I would also like to express my deep honor and pleasure to share my views and issues and challenges related to environment and development. As we, a global community, are facing at the special occasion of the Forest Asia Summit 2014, under the meaningful themes of sustainable landscapes for green growth in Southeast Asia. Furthermore, I would also like to say that today this summit reflects our regional community's strong interest to promote forestry cooperation in order to solve environmental issues such as global warming and climate change, deforestation, desertification and land degradation, and drought loss of biodiversity and poverty. In this very broad context, I'm hoping that this summit will provide the impetus to us so that our Asia region will be able to move forward in the implementation of cooperative and partnership programming pertaining to forestry as well as green growth in Southeast Asia. Therefore, I am very much hopeful that the Forest Asia Summit 2014 will be able to develop brilliant synergies and ideas to be materialize the regional cooperation in the years to come. In this juncture, I would like to commend to those who have developed wisdom to convey this summit because I honestly see that this summit will also serve us the symbolic and our long-term cooperation and our commitments toward implementing sustainable forest management as well as 
the further strengthening to achieving the common goal of sustainable development through policy innovation and invention of modus operandi that will accelerate the implementation of low carbon technologies such as the use of 3R, reduce, reuse and recycle, and efficient use of natural resources for green growth. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the common goal of our goal is to achieve sustainable development, which refers to securing the planet's availability of natural resources for the present and future generations. So far, two Earth summits have been held in 1992 and 2012 at Rio de Janeiro, Janeiro and adopted guidelines for our planet sustainability. Green economy and green economy is one of the paramount important tools for achieving sustainable development because the green economy, green growth, in the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication, is one of the two main discussions areas in Rio Plus 20 in the year 2012. In this regard, efficient use of natural resources is paramount important factor of green economy, green growth, because it will enhance our ability to manage natural resources sustainability. Also reduce negative environmental impacts, increase resource efficiency, and reduce waste. At present, the world population is 7 billion, and it is predicted that it will reach to 9 billion by the year 2050. Obviously, the rise in population will have undesirable impacts to use the natural resources, particularly our critical forest and plant genetic resources as well. Here, I would like to highlight the critical role of environmental, environmentally sound technology, research and development technical technological transfer to developing countries and technological innovation, including in support of green growth in the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication. Besides, I would like to see the importance of linking financing, technology, capacity building, and national needs for sustainable development. Nowadays, achieving our common goal of sustainable development has been the greatest challenge to our mankind, particularly to the governments. The, e the key issue here is now governments and financial institutions will set policies which can facilitate and encourage green economic opportunities and green innovation and green growth in our Southeast Asia. <clears throat> the overarching challenge is to create enabling policies to help scale up the existing solutions and to promote innovation for future enhance en enhancements. In this regard, I would like to say that individual countries cannot overcome the interconnected problems such as extreme poverty, drought and hunger, development gaps between the poor and the rich countries, economic instability, social inequality and environmental degradation and so on. We all know that it is vital to continue effective international cooperation so that we realize to full achievement of the development goals while maintaining the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities as the foundation of the current and future global development efforts. 
Here, I would like to emphasize the key role of forests in seeking development because forests not only give us environmental protection functions, but also provide numerous ecosystem services, and therefore we have to protect and conserve forests to our utmost priority. It is also very important to position forests and landscapes at the core of ongoing policy making processes in the region related to green growth, poverty eradication, sustainable land use, climate change mitigation and adaptation, food security and nutrition, and the achievement of the ASEAN Community 2015. Moreover, highlighting the role sustainable landscapes can lead to the achieve our hope to environmental sustainability, equitable economic development in an e economically competitive and ecologically dynamic region, and to narrow down the development gaps among ASEAN member states. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, while I have this opportunity, I would like to share you the progress made in Myanmar politically, economically, and socially. Here, probably, you may have witnessed yourselves. Myanmar is now under the progress of transition and democratic nation and transformation, transformation economic modalities that we pave the way to construct the democratic and developed country. Now we are actively working with the world's communities achieve, to achieve the socio-economic development while conserving environment and changing economic path from brown to green economic development path. Similarly, significant progresses in the areas of peacemaking process, educational and agricultural development, then use settlement, diplomatic ties with the other countries, forest and environmental conservation and rural development have been achieved. In this regard, I would like to share you our happiness of receiving positive reflections and growing recognitions on our political, social, and economic development by the international communities. Promulgation, promulgating of environmental conservation law in 2012, development of EIA and SIA guidance, exercising log export ban, strengthening sustainable forest management, expanding protected area network, forest law enforcement, governance and trade, flag T, and extractive industry transparency initiative, EITI, is a significant efforts to make balance between development and environment for green growth. We also initiative reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation Red Plus in 2011. As a part of our efforts to reduce deforestation rate, strengthen sustainable forest management and enhance forest ecosystem services, RDD Plus Readiness Program was successfully developed in June 2013, and implementation of Red Plus Roadmap is in progress. Myanmar is a signatory to many international conventions, agreements, and treaties, including UNFCCC, UNCBD, UNCCD, and Kyoto Protocol. It reflects that the government of Myanmar is fully committed to climate change mitigation, sustainable forest management, restoration of degraded forest ecosystems, biodiversity conservation, combating desertification and rural development activities. 
Accordingly, these activities are being implemented as they are high on our development agenda of green growth. With regards to conservation of natural resources, including forests and wildlife, Myanmar forest policy, the forest law and the protection of wildlife and wild plants, and conservation on natural areas law are in place and, and are being exercised as a legal framework all over the country. Besides, environmental conservation law was also enacted in 2012 in order to regulate issues related to environment. Likewise, Myanmar National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, MBSEP, was formulated in 2011. And this framework is also comprehensive that it serves as a guide, guiding document for biodiversity conservation, natural resources management, and the sustainable utilization. Within this context, we have been trying our best to manage our forest resources on the sustainable basis for improved humanity and social equity while reducing environmental vulnerabilities and associated risks. I'm hoping that this summit will be able to improve, provide platform for ASEAN countries to engage in bilateral and multilateral exchanges with their global counterparts, business, executives, civil societies, and development partners in the pursuit of new green growth pathway for development in the region. For an environmentally sustainable future, we need to value our natural resources and ecosystem services to better inform policy and decision making, especially since ASEAN region is a hotspot of unique biodiversity and ecosystems. Myanmar firmly believes the Green Group Initiative in Southeast Asia will contribute <coughs> the irrigation uh, property as well as to the sustained economic growth, enhancing social inclusion, improving human wel welfare, and creating opportunities for employment and decent work for all, while maintaining the healthy functioning of the earth ecosystems. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, According to the summit agenda, I have learned that that will be a panel discussion on green growth in Southeast Asia. Within this broad contest, I am convinced and also encouraged that after my intervention, there will be a panel section. And for this important section, experts from various fields of studies are here and with us, and they will be contributing, contributing the environmental protection, gov protection, governance, sustainable resource management, and the development of sustainable landscape of green growth in the ASEAN region. Lastly, but not the least, I would like to express my profound appreciation and gratitude to all the organizers, partners, international organizations, speakers, and participants for their tremendous effort to successfully hold on this summit. I firmly believe that we will be able to achieve result oriented outcomes at the end of the summit. I look forward to work together with you all of you in the future. I wish you all and the Forest Asia Summit 2014 will be very success. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much indeed, Your Excellency, for your speech this morning. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you His Excellency Vivian Balakrishnan, Minister for Environment and Water Resources of Singapore. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I am standing between you and your cup of coffee, so I'm going to try to keep this short. I hope to leave you with three points. We have a problem. But the first point is that the root of this problem is misaligned commercial interests. The reason companies burn forests and engage in unsustainable degradation of our land is because of short-term profits. The second point, the main victims of this, in fact, are the local indigenous people living on and adjacent those lands that are subject to such environmental vandalism. The third point is that there is therefore an urgent need for governments, for non-government organizations, and for local communities to insist on transparency, to collaborate more effectively, to pursue investigations, and to prosecute those responsible. So those are the three points I wanted you to remember. The rest of my speech you can accept and take at face value. We are here today, as I said, and because we have a problem. And there are three key reasons why this problem matters. First, the loss of biodiversity. Second, the huge emission of greenhouse gases. And third, the negative and real impact that these practices have on our local communities. The forests of Southeast Asia make up about 5% of the world's total. But I think many people don't appre sufficiently appreciate the fact that there is greater biodiversity in the forests of Southeast Asia than there is in even the Amazon or in the African rainforest. And there's certainly greater biodiversity, even in a tiny spot like Singapore, than the entire continental United States. So the point is, if we mismanage the rainforest in our neighborhood, this is a loss not just for us, but indeed for the entire world. But we know, unfortunately, that Southeast Asia is losing rainforests at an unprecedented rate. A 2013 publication in the journal Science revealed that the amount of forests lost globally from 2000 to 2012 is approximately 2.3 million square kilometers. To put this in context, this is about 3,100 times the size of Jakarta, or indeed 1.2 times that of the entire Indonesian. The forests in Southeast Asia are not spared from this worrying development. And it is basically being driven by economic interests. Logging, pulpwood clear-cutting clear have also led to extensive deforestation. But it's not just the loss of biodiversity, but also the impact on global climate change. Deforestation contributes at an alarming rate to the emission of greenhouse gases. In fact, a 2010 REDD report suggests that the majority of Indonesia's greenhouse gas emissions actually stems from land use activities. 37% of it due to deforestation and 27% due to peat fires. In fact, deforestation occurring on peatlands especially peatlands that have been cleared by burning, releases 
a disproportionate amount of carbon dioxide. I saw a recent study, in fact, this was research conducted by C4, and it estimated that in June last year, when we experienced the worst episode of haze so far in Southeast Asia, in June last year, the estimate is that about, let me get the figures correct, about 171 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalents of greenhouse gases were emitted. To put that 171 megatons in context, that represents about 10% of Indonesia's reported annual greenhouse gas emissions for the period from 2000 to 2005. So it's ironic that we spend, and I'm on the climate change circuit, all of us negotiators have a very big footprint because we jet all over the world to release more hot air in our negotiations. But I find it ironic that we argue about shaving a few percentage points in international commitments. Yet right here in our neighborhood, we're releasing such copious amounts of carbon dioxide. So we need to be frank about it and to accept that we do have a problem, and that in fact, the whole issue of sustainable development of forests is a complex issue. Because in addition to being a source of biodiversity and of providing pulp and logging, we have to contend with the competing issues of land development, of agriculture. And it is also a supremely ironic that even as we clear our forests and even as we emit more carbon dioxide because we need more land for agriculture to feed our people. But ultimately, this is self-defeating because as climate change progresses and the sea levels rise and we get more drought and we get more floods, nature will take revenge on us and in fact, our agricultural systems will be put at risk. So that is why, if we continue on this current trajectory, all of us are in trouble. I started off my speech by asking you to just remember the three points, which is that the root cause was commercial, the main victims are local, and that the solution requires collaboration, effective, decisive action, on the parts of governments, NGOs, and local communities. Let me just expand a little on that. Last year, Southeast Asia experienced one of the worst episodes of haze ever. And the negative impact that that had on our economy, on our livelihoods, on our environment, and on most importantly, on the health of our people was unprecedented. Despite this happening in June, and we would have thought we learned a lesson. But the brutal truth is that, in fact, in January and February this year, the fire burning season began even earlier, taking advantage of a drought which occurred in our region. So, so far, the signs are not promising. The haze affected Singapore. But it is important to remember that there are far more citizens in Indonesia and Malaysia who are affected far worse than my fellow citizens in Singapore. Businesses also suffered losses. Workers could not get to work sites. Even wafer fabs were affected because the air in their plants was contaminated. Airports were closed. Accidents occurred. And we all know that, in fact, the external costs of such a disaster far exceeded the short term profits that the companies would have made. And for too many years, our region has grappled with this recurrent challenge without making much progress. We cannot and should not blame traditional slash-and-burn 
agriculture. Slash and burn agriculture has been occurring for thousands of years, but we didn't have haze on this unprecedented level before. The reason we have it is because of industrial scale deforestation at an unprecedented level. And this happens because the short term gains are too compelling, whilst the companies are not liable for paying for the damage that they cause to the external environment, to the larger economy, and to the people who are most affected by their actions. So the question then, which confronts us, is can we realign the interests? Because you see, my friends, it's important for us to realize that to call a halt to development it's not possible. It's not viable. Every nation, every group of people has a right to development, has a right to growth, has a right to feed his or her family. So the question is, how do we grow our economies? How do companies make profits? but in a sustainable way and in a fair way. I would leave you with three final thoughts. The first is that people have rights. They have rights to jobs, to growth, to health, and to security, and to long-term safety despite the threat of climate change. Second point is that companies have responsibilities. Companies have to make a profit. Without a profit, you don't exist. But you've got to make your profits in a way which accounts for the impact that you have on the local communities and on the environment. And the really viable, sustainable, long-term companies are those who can account for this completely. The third point is transparency. And that is where NGOs and the more responsible companies come into it. We now live in a day and age, satellite photos being available almost real time, of drones being able to ground truth data, of cheap air quality sensors of an always-on, always-connected world, of the internet. We've got to turn those eyes and build a system of transparency which makes people accountable for their actions. And companies operating in such a transparent world. I'll give you an example. Unilever has committed that it will track the source of its palm oil, all the way down to the plantation. And therefore, it sends the message that it wants its sources to be derived from sustainable practices. We need to start to wake up and to operate in such a transparent world. And if we do that, I believe it is possible to develop, to make a profit, to be responsible, and to look after our people. Only and only if we do that, then can we fulfill the goal that President Susilo Bambang Yudo you know, said just now, which is that we're not making decisions just for the present, but to leave a legacy, a viable legacy for the next generation to come. So I thank you all very much for the honor of being able to address you and to speak so frankly to all of you. I look forward to your deliberations and most important, to your actions to leave a better world for the next generation. Thank you very much.